think so. Yeah. Oh, let me just think. Got it. Yeah, we're going to record just for the purposes of um, for okay. folks who couldn't make it. Good to go then? I think yes. so, Rachel. Take it away, Rachel. All right. Thank you so much. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the IPHD Projects Research Advisory Committee orientation. Um, thank you so much, first, for accepting the invitation to participate on the, you know, we have to love our acronyms, the RAC, <laughs> the Research Advisory Committee. Really appreciate you accepting that invitation and also your time in attending the orientation today. My name is Rachel Hammond. I do see, as Margaret said, there's a lot of familiar faces and some new faces and names to me as well. Um, I chair the IPHD governing board. Uh, the board oversees the IPHD project and will ultimately be responsible to approve applications from researchers before they can access um, data from the project. So, the RAC and your participation on the RAC and your expertise in reviewing these applications is really going to provide critical information to the governing board relative to our review and approval of these applications. You're going to be helping us to know is the applicant qualified? Um, is there scientific merit? Is there alignment with the purpose of the IPHD project? and the research priorities. And I know our colleagues at Rutgers will go over all of this in quite a bit more detail. So we're very grateful for your participation and your attendance today. I wanna to do um, brief introductions. And I think I'll just kind of go down the list because there's a, a good number of us on and sort of call out your name and give you a moment to introduce yourself. If you wanna say um, your name, um, an organization, if you're representing an organization, um, job title or area of expertise, that would be wonderful. Anything else you'd like to add for the group's benefit, also very welcome. Um, after we do introductions, we'll turn it over to our colleagues at Rutgers to get into the, um, the really the meat of this meeting, an overview of the IPHD project and the actual work of the um, Research Advisory Committee. So without further ado, let me go down the list and ask is uh suzanne are you on i'm sorry i can't see everybody on my screen so i'm not sure if everyone's yes, uh, here I, i'm here hi suzanne hi rachel so um i'm suzanne boris and i'm the assistant director for planning research evaluation prevention in olmstead with the division of mental health and addiction services and my office um oversees all prevention activities for our division, uh, responsible for planning, you know, developing new programs. Uh, we control, we manage, uh, monitor our federal grants. You know, we have two um, uh, allocated grants, our federal substance abuse block grant and our mental health block grant. Plus we have numerous uh, discretionary grants that we've applied for and received. So, um, yeah, we're pretty busy. A lot going on. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Bhavani? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bhavani Satya. I'm uh, with DOH, and I'm the Director of Data Systems within our Division of Epi Environmental and Occupational Health. Um, so that does include uh, CDRSS and GIS and uh, a number of other systems. Um, and uh, glad to be here and understand uh, this effort further. Thank you. Thanks, Bhavani. Derek? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Derek D'Elia. I am a health economist by training. Uh, I'm with the MedStar Health Research Institute, uh, which is in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm also on the faculty at the uh, Georgetown University Medical School. Um, I was with the Rutgers Center for State Health Policy for about uh, 15 years. Uh, I've been with MedStar for about four. Wonderful. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Uh, Young. Is Yong on? Oh, hi, I'm oh. Yong. <laughs> hi, anyway, Yong. Yeah. hi everyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing with a lot of data, especially UV. I'm working on some interesting reports 
for example, like how COVID-19 affect like our UV data in terms of volumes and proportions is very interesting for me. I'm looking for that answer. Or I study some kind of like a vaccination effect on COVID cases in terms of hospital, hospitalization data. It's quite interesting for me. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to join you guys. Thank you so much, Yang. Uh, Marilyn? Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Marilyn Gorney Daly, and I'm with the Department of Health. I'm in the Division of Family Health Services. Uh, I'm medical director for maternal child health, and that includes um, areas like reproductive and perinatal health, maternal child health epidemiology, home visiting, and child and adolescent health. So happy to be here. Uh, my background's, sorry, my background's pediatrics and public health. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Appreciate it. Kelly? I am Kelly Noonan. I am a lecturer or health economist in Princeton, and I'm also affiliated with the Center for Health and Wellbeing there. Most of my research actually focuses on, I guess, maternal health. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kelly. Pleasure to meet you. Erin. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Erin uh, Churchill, Director of Analytics of the Cannon Coalition. The Cannon Coalition is a nonprofit down in South uh, Jersey that's working to improve the care delivery system for patients with complex health and social needs. Um, we're also one of the state's designated regional health hubs. Um, and we have a lot of experience working with integrated data sets and have been longtime cheerleaders and um, supporters of the IPHD project. So delighted to be with you all. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Great to see you. Uh, Robin. Hi, all. Robin Dioria. I'm the CEO of Central Jersey Family Health Consortium. We're a nonprofit in North Brunswick that Primarily, uh, we're one of three maternal child health consortia in the state, and we do public health initiatives in with the maternal child health focus. Personally, I'm an advanced practice nurse in perinatal nursing for the first half of my career, which was focused primarily in acute care, and have been in the public, he public health sector for the second half. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, Robin. Thank you for being here. Uh, Stephanie. Sorry, it took me a second to find the unmute because mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'd have had it by now. Um, so I'm Stephanie Silvera. I'm a professor of public health at Montclair State University, where I'm also the graduate program coordinator. I am an epidemiologist by training. Um, I also have a master's in nutrition where I used to work at WIC. So I had no wow. in maternal and child health. Um, most of my research these days focuses on structural inequalities and resulting um, health inequities. Great. I'm Welcome. really excited to be a part of this. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Douglas. Hello, everyone. I'm Doug McCarthy, president of Issues Research in Colorado. I have a background in health system performance measurement, which is my connection to Rutgers. Um, and working with Joel and Margaret on developing the Commonwealth Fund scorecards on health system performance. And I also conduct qualitative research on best practices. I chair the board of Colorado's all-payer claims database. Nice to meet you all. Fantastic. Thank you, Doug. Pleasure to meet you. Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Barrett. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology at the Rutgers School of Public Health. Um, and I would say broadly, my interests are in environmental exposures in relation to maternal and child health. Wonderful. Thank you, Emily. Good to meet you. Uh, Daniel. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Horton. I'm an assistant professor of pediatrics and epidemiology uh, at Rutgers Robert Johnson Medical School and the School of Public Health. I'm based at the Institute for Health at a different center, the Center for Pharmacopedemiology and Treatment Science, and my uh, research uh, focuses on the uses and safeties, uh, safety of medications in children uh, using large databases. Great. Thank you, Dan. Great to meet you. Uh, Abate. Hi, my, I'm Abate Mamo. 
Uh, I currently work for the New Jersey Hospital Association in New Jersey, in Princeton. Before that, I used to work for the Department of Health uh, in different capacities. My background is in statistics and demography. And most of my uh, work life has been in surveys, uh, population health areas, so health services, uh, the data related activities in general. So that's what I am currently also engaged in. Thank you. Thank you, Abate. Great to see you. Uh, Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. I am a professor of economics at Emory University and formerly of uh, Rutgers Newark. So it's nice to be back. Uh, my area of expertise is um, public policy and health generally, maternal and child health, and I've been doing some work on scope of practice about nurses. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Great to meet you. I think our next person is uh, Ramesh. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ramesh Raghavan. I'm a psychiatrist and mental health services researcher by training. Um, I do work on access to and quality of mental health services for vulnerable child populations, uh, primarily those in the child welfare system, although increasingly children with disabilities. Um, I, um, um, I'm currently at NYU at the Silver School. Um, and before coming to NYU, I was on the faculty at uh, Rutgers and had an appointment at the, as an affiliate appointment at the Institute for Health as well. So thank you for having me back. Oh, thank you for coming back. Pleasure to meet you. Um, Lawrence. Hi, I'm Larry Kleinman. I am a professor of pediatrics um, at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and professor of global public health, the Rutgers School of Public Health. Sorry, I am. I don't have a lot of voice, but I'm, I'm going to try to get through this. Um, I'm a vice chair of the Department of Pediatrics, and uh, and I head a division known as Population Health Quality and Implementation Sciences, or Pop Quiz, as we like to call ourselves. And and I'm a general pediatrician, health services researcher, with a broad interest and experience in um, in quality of care, maternal child health. Uh, I'm PI of the HRSA funded Maternal Child Health Measurement Research Network um, and uh, currently of um, a couple of federally funded uh, uh, efforts um, looking at COVID. So I've become a COVID researcher um, and uh, um, I, I have a variety of expertise because I'm old. I've been around a long time. And I, I've been back at, at Rutgers for about uh, two years, having left in the 1970s when I graduated undergraduate and I grew up in New Brunswick. So it's great to be back home. Great to have you back home. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, Marianne? Hi, I'm Marianne, rhymes with librarian Bittler, which you'd never guess from my name. Um, and I'm a professor of economics at UC Davis. My research is at sort of the intersection of public economics and health economics with a focus on the safety net and particularly food assistance programs and more uh, on children's outcomes and family outcomes. Great, thank you, pleasure to meet you. And we have another governing board member sitting in with us, Rashvi. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rashmi Jain and uh, uh, my background is in uh, information technology systems and data analytics. Um, I am a professor at Montclair State University in the School of Business with the uh, Department of Information Systems and Business Analytics. Um, I have uh, had the pleasure to work with the, uh, with the team, uh, with Rachel, Margaret, and, and Joel and the other governing board members, and it's been um, a long uh, process to get to this, uh, but it's really worth uh, the, the effort and the time. I've really enjoyed uh, being on the technical committee as well as the um, uh, other initiatives. Um, so at uh, Montclair, I am uh, involved in uh, research on uh, business analytics uh, projects as well as, um, so, so some of the examples are, uh, uh, effectiveness of customer initiatives and 
uh, price dynamics and um, you know um, a few others. Uh, I'm also on the expert architecture committee at uh, New York Science Academy um, or New York Academy of Sciences um, and on the uh, Society for Information Management Board in, in New York. Uh, but my majority of my current research has been on issues around um, uh, healthcare analytics, uh, how analytics is being implemented in healthcare, pharmaceutical area, and some uh, uh, other related topics. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rashmi. It looks like we have a couple more people with us. Um, Tim? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Tim Saplaki. I'm with uh, the Office of Emergency Medical Services in the New Jersey Department of Health. I oversee the data collection for pre-hospital um, uh, paramedic and basic life support ambulances in New Jersey. Uh, so I've been part of the board for several years. So it's nice to see that it uh, came to this point. So I'm very happy to see Abate as well. Uh, hi, Abate, I haven't seen him in a while. <laughs> Thank you hi, so Tim. much. <laughs> good, to, good to hear. <laughs> it's a reunion for some of us. Um, it looks like a couple of other folks were able to join today. Um, Catherine? Hi everybody, I'm Kathy Hempstead. I work at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In the past, I was at the Center for State Health Policy and I was also at the state and uh, I'm old too, as someone else mentioned. <laughs> so hello everybody, nice to see you. Nice to see you too, thank you for joining us. And it looks like there's someone on, Dr. Chris Purnell. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Purnell here at University Hospital. Um, I am the Chief Strategic Integration and Health Equity Officer. This office is a new role that was created under leadership of our CEO, Dr. Elma Hall. I've been here for a little over two years. This is my hometown, East Orange, North area. Um, this office oversees the patient and human experience, community and population health, um, strategic planning, as well as community affairs, and is responsible for the hospital's first ever equity and inclusion strategy development. Oh, and awesome. I'm a public health and preventive medicine physician um, by training. Thank you so much, Catherine. And um, I think maybe we have one more person before I ask the Rutgers folks to introduce um, Kelly with a double E. She, I think she might have messaged that she had was having trouble. Um, she's having some electricity issues to oh. logging on. So maybe we'll um, ask the Rutgers folks to introduce themselves and hopefully we can come back to, to the other Kelly. Do you want to kick us off, Joel? Oh, sure. I'm, I'm Joel Cantor. Uh, I direct the Center for State Health Policy and I'm a member of the Public Policy faculty, you'll hear more from me in a moment. Uh, Margaret? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Kohler. I'm the executive di director of the center. Jose? Uh, I think we have um, Kate on the line. Kate Scotto. There you are. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Scotto. I'm the finance person on the IPHD project. Thanks. Ed? Hi, my name is Feng Yidu, go by Ed. Uh, I'm a data analyst in the Center for State Health Policy. Nice Thank to meet Thanks. Uh, Jose? Good afternoon, everyone. Jose Nova, Assistant Director for Data Management at the Center. Um, I will be seeing um, data management and data integration operations uh, for the IPHD project. Great, thanks. Uh, Oliver? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Oliver Lantock. I'm a research manager at the Center for State Health Policy. Great, and I think we have Manisha rounds out the team, unless I miss somebody. I'm Manisha Agrawal. I'm a senior research analyst at the Center. Nice to see everyone. Thank you, and I missed Jolene. Oh, Jolene's on. Sorry about Sorry. that. <laughs> That's okay. Hi, my name is Jolene Chow, research analyst at the center supporting the IPHD project. Nice to meet, meet everybody. 
Thank you. You're on the very last page. There's I have to scroll through a bunch of pages here. So I think we have everybody. Please speak up now if we've not given you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Great. Without further ado. Hi. Oh. oh. No, go ahead. Uh, Nicole Vaughn from Rowan University. Hey, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry we missed you. Okay. Anybody else that didn't get a chance to introduce themselves? Okay, great. So I think um, we just missed um, Kelly who's having troubles connecting. So we will um, let her jump in at some point later. She's able to hop back on the uh, orientation and without further ado, turn it over to my colleagues at Rutgers. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm going to go through a few of the uh, overview slides of, about the IPHD project. Uh, I know that Oliver had shared a packet of information prior to the holiday that's, that um, included uh, documents, the uh, RFA, the scoring sheet, some more background about the IPHD. What we're going to talk about today is sort of a synthesis of all of that, pulling out the highlights. Joel and I are going to tag team. I'll talk a little bit about, as I say, um, the purpose, the overview of the um, research priorities and data sets, and then Joel's going to kind of bring us home with some um, uh, more detailed discussion about the role of the research advisory and um, uh, really what our ask is of, of you. So Oliver, can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. Um, so for those of you who, who may not be as familiar as the, the long and winding road of the IPHD project, uh, it was enacted in, through legislation in, uh, in September of 2016. The goal of the IPHD is to promote population health research by New Jersey research organizations and really leaning heavily on the research institutions in New Jersey and, and convening a New Jersey research consortium, um, bringing together the, the research talent uh, in the state. Establishes a process to integrate data from publicly supported programs for population health research. We've started with data from the New Jersey Department of Health, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we um, move on through the meeting. There are two real goals, primary goals for the IPHD. We're looking to improve population health, safety, security, and the well being of, of residents of the state, and improve the cost efficiency of uh, government assistance programs. There is a strong and I, I think really robust, um, well, uh, um, it, it, we've, we've really uh, leaned heavily on our governing board process, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But a couple of members of the board are, are, um, are with us today, and I, we have really active engagement by our governing board. And I, I think it's a really, um, it's a testament to the commitment of folks who have really stuck with us. As Rashmi has, has said, now going into our sixth year, um, the, the inside baseball secret is part of the legislation says that the IPHD will be up and running within a year of execution and signature of the legislation. So you can do the math on that from 2016, but we're really close and we're really excited. Um, legislation authorizes the operation to be seated at the uh, Rutgers Center for State Health Policy and where um, you know, we obviously take that responsibility very seriously. We have our own uh, website that is designated now for the IPHD and there is the link that obviously we have some additional detailed information about the project there. Thanks, Oliver. This is a list of our governing board members. Um, again, Rashmi and Rachel are on the call today. Uh, we do have representatives, ex officio representatives from um, uh, New Jersey Department of Human Services, somebody from Medicaid who's participating um, as well as uh, we have a, a vacancy right now from uh, Treasury, and we have representation from the Attorney General's office. We also have appointments that have been made by the Governor's office, public appointments through the Governor's office, Speaker of the um, uh, Assembly and the Senate President. So we are um, down one vacancy right now representing State Treasury, and we hope to fill that. But as I say, active engagement, wide um, breadth of expertise, and um, I, I think we're really proud of the functioning of our governing board. Oliver, can you go to the next slide? So just a little bit more about the roles and the responsibilities of our governing board. We, uh, the project is established in but not of the New Jersey Department of Health, and that's why uh, Rachel is the designee of the Commissioner of Health, chairing the, um, the governing board. 
The responsibilities include publishing policies and procedures um, on, on privacy, data access, data retention. We have the research uh, consultation with subject matter experts. And again, this is really about touting and building, leveraging the research capacity within the state. Um, we've established research priorities and uh, identified the initial data sets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think what's important to think about is that when we are um, uh, talking about the IPHD launching in the coming months, this is IPHD 1.0. And we are building the bedrock right now are the data sets from the Department of Health, but we have a, a, a big plans to expand to other administrative agencies. That was always the goal, but there's proof of concept that's necessary. So, you know, we're taking it one step at a time. And, and frankly, you can see how long it's taken us to get to, to, to this point now. So we are thinking strategically about um, next phases of the IPHD, but for now we're, we're focusing on uh, DOH data sets. The IPHD, um, the governing board operates as a public body, which means we have conflict of interest guidelines, open public meeting requirements, administrative pr procedures, uh, and public reporting. And we've met uh, at least quarterly, but over the last 18 months or so, it's, it's been um, uh, more on a monthly or bi-monthly schedule. So active engagement. Oliver, thank you. Uh, these are the initial research priorities that were approved by the governing board in March of 2019. So we're about two and a half years, almost three years into the approval of the initial priorities. And we did have a, um, uh, a meeting of research institutions and researchers through, in New Jersey in 2018 that really informed the development of these initial research priorities. And that one is, is uh, aimed at the um, informing New Jersey's integrated approach to addressing the opioid epidemic. The second uh, priority involves maternal and infant health and improving maternal and infant health outcomes in New Jersey. And we know that, that that's a challenge. And we also know it's, it's certainly a priority for the administration. And we're happy that we were able to include that in our um, initial menu of, of priorities. And then the third priority that we um, uh, initially adopted in, in uh, 2019 was really our, our, our broadest priority, which is the social determinants of health and um, access to physical and behavioral health services and addressing you know, social determinants, thinking of this as whole person care. So of all of these, this is probably our broadest priority. Um, and you know, fast forward in spring of 2020, we know what happened and the, the uh, governing board voted to include a fourth research priority um, that includes COVID-19 and responding to other public health emergencies. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, the data sets that, will, um, that are uh, aligned with these priorities. So as I say, we are um, leaning heavily on our colleagues at the Department of Health, um, uh, both our, our, our policy and our program colleagues, as well as our, uh, the data stewards for these data sets. These are the initial five data sets that we'll be bringing in from the Department of Health. I would say with Rachel's um, leadership and um, effort, we now have a fully executed data use agreement to bring all of these, these five data sets, identified data sets into the, um, uh, the Rutgers environment. We're looking at the birth data, the mortality data, the CDRSS, the surveillance data for COVID. I would say the, for that data set, because it is communicable disease registry, we will only be receiving those data that are related to, um, to COVID. And then the UB hospital um, billing data and then uh, the EMS data, which our, our colleague um, Tim Saplaki has, we've worked with him in the past. And it's a, it's a vastly complex um, data set and, and we really look forward to, to working with Tim to, um, uh, as, as we make those, those transfers. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Joel now, and Joel's gonna talk, us, talk about the eligibility, the application process, and sort of our, how we're gonna operationalize this in a few months. Joel? Great, thanks. And I'm, I'm also gonna speed through fairly quickly. Uh, to make sure we leave time at the end for for questions and i think uh we did send some materials in advance we we can send a pdf of the slides after the call as well so uh no need to take copious notes um so uh to begin with 
who are the IPHD data users or who's eligible to apply for and receive IPHD data? Um, it's really any qualified researcher, so long as they are proposing work that aligns with the purpose and um, uh, board endorsed priorities of, of the IPHD uh, in this first year and hopefully in the second year of data availability. Uh, we plan to make some pilot funding available for New Jersey based uh, institutions, uh, not just Rutgers, this is very much a New Jersey based program, not a Rutgers based program. Um, for those who are interested in data, uh, but are either not eligible or don't get one of the pilots, um, there will be some, we will have to collect some fees uh, from them uh, uh, once the project's approved and, and folks agree to, to accept the data uh, for, for their project. And we'll have updates on this, this down the road. I think the fees will be sort of competitive with uh, fees for comparable data in other venues. Uh, students will be encouraged to apply uh, uh, um, under faculty supervision. Um, all data users will be required to comply with applicable laws, uh, as well as IPHD policies and procedures as enacted by our board. They'll have to have IRB approval, uh, follow our uh, privacy and security guidelines. The data sets that will be provided to folks will be, uh, we, we will remove direct identifiers. They'll meet HIPAA minimum necessary standards. Um, so um, f uh, that'll really be tailored to each project. We are, uh, we'll be doing a lot of outreach, particularly among New Jersey researchers to uh, really encourage applications from a diverse pool, um, uh, and including folks from groups that have been traditionally underrepresented in, in population health research. Um, so um, how, will, how will this all work? So we have an application process. The details are on the website. The packet sent ahead has draft uh, application materials and review materials. The center plays an administrative role um, where we help folks figure out the application process. We're trying to keep it straightforward, but it never is. <laughs> um, we will do an initial completeness and compliance review. We will select uh, from among our RAC members to do reviews, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and then we will summarize the RAC reviews and put together the package for the governing board, which has the final say on what's approved uh, among, among the applicants, what projects are approved. Um, once um, uh, the, the process moves forward, the board approves, the center will step back in and work with data users to execute data use agreements. We will prepare customized, integrated, linked, uh, HIPAA compliant, limited data sets. We'll provide technical assistance to the best of our ability. Um, uh, we don't know all of these data sets very well. We will be liaison with the, the state data stewards so that they're not inundated with questions uh, from a bunch of different users. Um, and then we will be the the, the heavies when it comes to reporting and compliance requirements over time. So next, please. So what is the RAC and what is the, their role? We should say, what is your role? So we have identified 34 uh, subject matter research and data experts. And you heard the introductions. You see the caliber of folks that we have uh, attracted at least to this stage. Um, this this is one of two sessions, so uh, the folks we have on this call may not, we, I mean, there are more, <laughs> plus there's a few folks who can't make either call, which is why we're recording this. So it's a really diverse group of folks with expertise across the research priorities, either as subject matter experts, research methodologists, or people who really know the data sets uh, that we're using here. We will have three, at least three RAC members review each application with matched by expertise. Uh, we anticipate that there will be two and maybe going forward more uh, review cycles per year, depending on the volume. We will be offering honoraria where we can uh, to RAC members. Um, we don't have the exact amount set yet, but 
um, you know, don't count on sending your kids to college with the uh, with the honoraria. Um, the uh, application re review will use a, a very structured process uh, and will cover alignment with the stated research priorities, the qualifications of the applicant, the validity of the methods, uh, and so forth. And then, as I said, the board gets final say on, on uh, what's approved. Next, please. Um, so the review forms, as I mentioned, were sent with the packet. I think they're also attached to the uh, Outlook invitation. Um, this is this process is really modeled after the NIH review process with some modifications. The things listed here are the principal questions. Those of you who are NIH reviewers may be saying, "Ah, where's innovation?" And we had a lot of discussion about that in the in the governing board. And in fact, we are interested in innovation and we consider it part of significance. But this is supposed to advance population health in New Jersey. So a project may simply be a replication of something that was done somewhere else, which wouldn't score high on innovation, but it could be critically important, which is why we've skewed the review criteria thus, thusly. Next, please. So I am not going to go through this in detail. We also um, modeled our conflict of interest guidelines after NIH guidelines with a few tweaks um, to adjust to our situation. Uh, folks will uh, stay out of a cycle if they're involved in an application. They uh, will stay out of a review of a particular applications if certain conflicts arise as enumerated in these bullets. Next, please. Um, and where we will allow folks to review uh, if they have more distant relationships with the applicants as listed here, so long as they feel and attest that that they can they can be objective in the review. And again, we will send this out to you. And once we're ready to send you applications, you'll see it again. So uh, we're really serious about the, adhering to strong conflict guidelines. I see Rachel smiling. She approves. <laughs> so, Rachel's also the privacy officer at DOH. So there we go. OK, next, please. So um, as Margaret said, it's been, a, it's been a road to get here. There are a lot of complications, um, details to work out, but we feel very good about where we are now. Um, we have executed the, I call it the data in, data use agreement, um, and are working on the transfer of all these uh, data sets from DOH into the center's high security computing environment. Our staff, Ed and Jose, and probably others as we move forward, will be uh, preparing the data. Some of it's very research ready, some of it's not. Um, and they will be working on pulling it together um, we are working on our data linkage protocols uh, and so on. Um, uh, Margaret mentioned the research consortium meeting. This is something that is actually um, uh, required in the legislation. And it's part of the objective to really promote population health research by New Jersey researchers. It's kind of a economic stimulus goal <laughs> from the legislature to say, OK, we want more of this. We want to bring in more grants and we want uh, our, our uh, research institutions to be very competitive. So the research consortium uh, will be at least an annual meeting where we sort of market, if you will, the uh, IPHD um, and, and uh, really encourage people to use it uh, among a broad swatch of New Jersey-based researchers at universities and elsewhere. Um, it'll also be a venue for input on future research priorities, and uh, which data sets we may uh, add in future years. Uh, and, and then ultimately, uh, and hopefully not too distant future, it'll be a venue for people to share their findings with one another. We are aiming to begin receiving research applications uh, early summer with uh, the first reviews happening shortly thereafter, followed by governing board consideration and the first data sets going out by late summer or I'll even say early fall. Um, so that's where we stand. I think we, I think this is it, yes. Uh, so why don't we um, uh, take the slides down and so folks can see one another 
And given that we have about 30 some folks on the call, why don't you use the raise hand feature or, um, or feel free to stick a comment or question in the chat. Um, if you if you have questions, I know we went through that super fast, but we uh, we can answer questions now. Thank you, Joel. And just a quick note, Kelly with the double E is back with us, and we want to just give her a quick chance to introduce herself. Uh, hi, Kelly. <laughs> hi, Joel. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kelly White. I am an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Public Health. I am in the Department of Health Policy and Management. I am a trained epidemiologist. <clears throat> I'm really a social epidemiologist, and my research focuses on the role of racism on population health and aging inequalities. Thanks. And Thank welcome. you, Kelly. Okay, the floor is open. I can't see everybody, but I see. oh, there we go. Abate, okay. please go ahead. In one of the slides, I think towards the end, you mentioned that the data linkage protocols will be established. So is IPHD going to be doing data linking upon request or it will be done uh, and ahead of uh, the request? I, I, I'm just mm -hmm. curious how that's going to happen. Yeah, and I may ask Jose to chime in here as well, but um... You know, I th we think it's going to be more efficient to do uh, project specific linkages um, because there'll be various permutations of data sets and time periods and, and sub files and things like that. Jose, anything to add? I think that's right, Joel. Um, we envision it being project specific, but also sort of in the background, we'd like to, you know, as time allows, sort of to, to do that um, for as much as we can. So sort of, in a sense, developing our own sort of master patient index. I know that's sort of a big endeavor, but um, that's sort of, sort of some of the things that we may have um, uh, have to be working on uh, on the background so that we can sort of answer uh, request, uh, more quickly, more efficiently. And I think we are we are committed to sort of documenting our linkage strategy. So when folks go to publish their work, there's a there's an appropriate level of transparency, you know, without opening the door to re-identification of folks. I think uh, we had a long uh, discussion, and I know this is Rachel's uh, expertise, but about uh, privacy of data. So we we I remember having long uh, conversations about where should the linkages happen and how much of linkages should be transparent to the researcher and should we actually do more than what is necessary? Um, so privacy perspective. Other questions? Uh, Aaron? Yeah, I was just wondering as part of the application support, how much availability on the Rutgers side to you know, run descriptives or, you know, is there going to be an effort to produce, um, you know, lots of documentation around fields and quality of, uh, you know, I think just to kind of um, give people some more confidence that what they're applying for is, is worthwhile. You know, we haven't talked much about the running descriptives. So, for example, if a researcher wants to know how many cases of a rare disease there are, um, it's not unusual to, to do some quick runs to see if it's even worth applying. We haven't really talked about that yet, but we could. Uh, the potential is there. Um, is that what you meant or something? Oh, yeah, right? totally. Some, and some of that would certainly hinge on if you're only doing linkage post-approval, then anything that requires descriptives of, you know, of a joint data set might not be feasible, but at least within data sets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And, um, you know, we we uh, the board specifically decided that we are not going to have an application fee. Uh, we will only the, all the costs are going to be allocated to the approved projects. So if you know we start putting something together and run into feasibility problems, and it turns out we can't meet a request, so, you know, we're not going to collect any fees for that. Other questions? Ah, Ramesh. 
So, Joel, this is, uh, and others, this is such a wonderful opportunity, right? So, thank you to New Jersey Legislature and for all of you for making this available to, to the scientific community. A um, couple of quick questions. So, um, it sounds to me that this has, and this is Margaret's comment as well, that this is a phenomenal nidus that can actually grow into a more holistic understanding of the health needs and interventions and outcomes for the people of New Jersey. And so, I was wondering, A, would you talk a little bit about your vision for how we can think about, in collaboration with external researchers, aggregate these data sets, bring in novel data sets that would allow us to identify uh, and answer questions that have not yet perhaps, um, that are not perhaps feasible under the current five data sets, rich as, as they are. And number two, um, having sort of done sort of data mergers like this, um, the construction of these so-called Chinese walls, which I've discovered is actually a real thing. It's a technical state-of-the-art term, apparently, um, where you know, identifying information is held in one place, but uh, key identifiers that are not identifying is held in the second place. And on the other side of the, and the third side of the double Chinese wall is where investigators typically do their mergers using not identifiable key identifiers. If that sort of a system is envisioned to be constructed because as we think about data set aggregations, um, that will be critical to, to feasibility of those sorts of larger data steps. So a, a wonderful set of questions. I'll do my best to address them. So uh, it seems that, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first part of your question relates to what, what if um, an applicant researcher wants to link in additional information from a third source. And um, there are ways to do that. Uh, the center in that case can act as the trusted third party to do the linkages. We do not anticipate sending out identifiers from these data sets, the direct identifiers um, to outside users. Um, but uh, you know we're aware of some examples. So say you're doing an intervention and you would like us to flag the people perhaps with a date of enrollment uh, in, uh, in your intervention in our data set. And we've done work like this in the Medicaid data. So we, uh, um, you send us the finder file, we link it, we attach the variables. We'll have to be very mindful of the uh, uh, pre preventing to the maximum extent possible the ability of the outside user to re-identify individuals. You know, they'll have their own roster, right? So, um, uh, so it'll be on a case by case basis, but we do think that there's a lot of scientific value in that kind of work and would really encourage uh, uh, doing it where it's appropriate. Um, your second question has to do with some of the security arrangements. And again, correct me if I'm misinterpreting, but um, some of you may be aware of the computing infrastructure at the Institute for Health, which is our, our um, institutional home. So we have a, um, an isolated computing environment. It's air-gapped, no connections to the outside world. Uh, it, 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 the, the staff physically have to put the data on. Somebody has to be there. It's not plugged into the internet. That's where we plan to do the work with the direct identifiers and all the linkage work. Uh, once data sets have a linkage ID, uh, the direct IDs will be moved off um, and secured, and then it'll be migrated to a high security uh, part of our network, which has lots of security measures, but it is accessible from the internet. And um, our plan is in most cases, uh, we feel that the res researchers will want to work on the data on their own computing platforms. So we'd be preparing and securely shipping data sets out to them. There'll be a process for vetting those platforms and data use agreements. And you can imagine, this is why it took us so long to get to where we are. Um, uh, in instances where they don't have a secure computing environment, uh, the, our Institute for Health can, can make access available. Um, so we would then refer it to the, the data core within the, the uh, institute. There'd be separate fees involved. We, we at the IPHD staff would get out of the arrangement and turn it over. It's, I'll be honest, it's a fairly expensive way to do business, 
So that's why I think folks will want their data sets on their own platforms. Does that cover it, Ramesh? Uh, very well, thank you, Joe. Thanks. It looks like Derek has his hand up. Yeah, just thinking about the significance of the proposals as that we're supposed to rank uh, proposals on significance. How much weight do we do you think we would have to put on? There are going to be some projects that are going to look really like academic projects, and they'll lead to publications. Um, others may be less publication oriented, but they just provide facts that are useful to organizations that are doing population health. Um, do we favor one or the other, or we take all comers and judge significance just based on what the goals of the project are? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a that's great, a, great a great question, and I think. Um, you know, our touchstone is the likelihood of uh, positively influencing population health, or as the second goal, the the, uh, the effectiveness or cost effectiveness of our governmental programs. That's the touchstone. The pathway from the research to impact, we're much more agnostic about. So, whereas a um, uh, an NIH study section might review for uh, really using the peer review publication as the highest standard. Uh, we use a, you know, we'll ask you to use a broader standard. Say, so, well, what's the likely impact? And um, getting the word out to the right people will be important, but it may or may not be the academic venues. Other questions? Looks like Larry has his actual hand up. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize, I missed the very beginning of this part of the conversation. But are things like um, engagement, commitment to population-based feedback or other things um, uh, considered as, uh, as issues related to significance or would they be relegated more to methods and approach? And I, 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 you know, I'm not exactly sure the problem I'm trying to answer with this question. It just seemed to come up when you, you mentioned the diversity of means of um, uh, potentially making work useful. It seemed to me that things that relate to engagement might have intrinsic value, so. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and the legislature saw fit to, to reserve a board seat for an advocate who can speak. I know this is a, a, a monumental task, but speak for the people whose data are we're looking at, the clients of our state programs. Um, so we have an eye, um, and it's not just that one member, but many of us believe that uh, engagement with the populations um, affected with the practitioners who serve them and so forth can be enormously valuable for sharpening the research, which is a methods issue, but also uh, improving its impact, which is a significance issue. So the answer is yes, both. Huh. It's not explicitly written in there, but you know, it's, it does put the thumb on the scale in my view. Joel, I would just add too, for, for to give some orientation because I've had some conversation with a few of the um, our colleagues here on the call about really what we're thinking about in terms of time commitment and how big this is going to be. Um, one of the reasons that we have 34 people in our research advisory committee is that we are really trying to make this a pretty light load for people, and obviously we want to have the right people and experts. Um, reviewing the proposals, but the idea is to have this deep bench so that we have some flexibility when people say, look, you know, I'm on, I'm on the, the rack, but this is just not a good time for me. I'm going to, you know, I can't participate. That's totally fine. And that's really why we've, we've gone as, as, as broad and as deep as we can, so we can operationalize this in an efficient way. We'll be perfectly candid and say, we don't know, you know, when we flip the sign open for business, we, 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 don't know what we're going to get and um, the volume. I think two years ago, we thought we were going to have to work really hard and, and, and be very focused about applications. Now, I think particularly with COVID data um, and being able to, to um, you know, uh, that we'll have access to the CDRSS, I think, I think there's going to be a pretty high demand. 
um, and we're preparing ourselves for that operationally. But part of that on the back end too is that we're respectful of your time commitment and honor what we've been having, you know, these conversations of saying this is going to be an efficient process with not an overwhelming looking at asking you to one or two applications in a cycle, if that, to give us some flexibility. So um, I would just say that because our goal is the, the pilot funding is competitive, but in terms of uh, preparing the data sets and sending the data sets out, we want to be as responsive as we can to good solid proposals. You know, we're not looking to screen things out. We, we want to generate quality, have generate, um, you know, response to quality proposals, but um, so it's that push and pull of, of not having our, our, our eyes be bigger than our stomach, you know, operationally, and particularly in the first phase of implementation. Um, but one of the reasons is that we're, we're also mindful of your incredibly demanding schedules and the time that you have to, to dedicate to this. Hence the reason that we have such a, a, a broad um, yeah. track. Our, as you'll see in the application materials, the applications are shorter, a little bit simpler. The review forms are similar to NIH, but we're not having study section meetings. We're not talking about it. We're not asking you to rescore and come to, you know, a summary uh, across, you know, a group. So it's there will be no day long meetings. Um, you know, that has its pros and cons, but but on balance, really, this is just the advice from three or more reviewers mm -hmm. to the board about what to do. And then they'll have a public meeting where these things are discussed, which is also very different than an NIH process or uh, where things are, are confidential until they're funded. Um, that this is an open process, um, which in, it'll be a little unusual for some folks. So I think we have about 30 seconds <laughs> or a minute. Uh, seeing no other oh, hands. Derek? Uh, oh, Derek. Derek. Oh, hello? Hello? Or Nicole. Is that Nicole? Hi, sorry. I'm on, I'm on the phone, yep, so I yep. can't see oh, okay. any hands. Yeah, yeah. Nicole. Um, but, but um, yeah, so this is Nicole from Rowan University. I didn't introduce myself. So I'm a health psychologist, associate professor, and also the co-director of the South Jersey Institute for Population Health and do a lot of health disparities um, intervention research um, in South Jersey. Now, the question I have is on the impact and dissemination plans that the researchers may have, given that this is, you know, public data and public, uh, you know, there'll be public review. Will they will they talk about sort of what their dissemination plan potentially will be, dis dissemination plan for the results of the data in their application? So that so it's very clear that the public know like what is going to happen with the data and what they're looking to do if it's going to be you know for peer-reviewed publications for conferences for dissemination back out to communities um will that be clear in these applications um i'd have to look at the details but i think so <laughs> uh it's in the forms uh the other thing that we're going to be requiring from the data users is a lay language summary that will be posted on the IPHD website uh, of, ma of major findings. Uh, so we're really committed to, um, you know, making sure the, f the findings get into the process. And copies of, of, of products. Yep, and, and copies of products yeah, where- Copies of products where, back out, exactly. Yep, like where that's, you know, and... that's right. And, and, and there are gonna be copyright issues, but we'll deal with it. So I, th I think we're yeah, at- I mean, I think, you know, yep. I think we sit at, you know, if you sit at the, the, the space of translation and being open to the public where people are really pushing now, I think that's going to be really important. I think that's right. And funders are increasingly requiring open access publications, and we will definitely capitalize on that. So with that, I think we have to call it a session. Thank you all. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Oliver will be the point of contact uh, with further questions, and we will be in touch by email as we get closer to the actual receipt of applications. And Oliver, can you please send the slides after this meeting, if you would, please, just yep. as a PDF? Thanks. We'll do. Thanks. Thanks. Thank every you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. This is great. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Well Bye. done, team. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.